Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got uh, a little bit to cover today. We've got the rest of the cardiovascular, the rest of the heart chapter to cover. And on Thursday, we will meet together and have a little test. That'll be a full-length test, so that's all you'll be doing that day. And the test is, uh, as all of them, are worth 90 points. I think I've got quite a few questions on there. Um, and then I gave you, did everybody get that blood sheet? Everyone got that blood sheet? I gave you a study sheet. It's hanging outside my office. I think I also uh, posted it on Blackboard. Basically, it's just a color cartoon representation of blood cells. And from that, you should be able to easily recognize the five different white blood cells, red cells, and platelets. And then you were asked to be able to identify them, uh, know their normal numbers in a drop of blood, know their normal ranges or percentages, know their special characteristics. And that'll be a matching. That'll be a word bank type thing. So there's 30 questions on the test that come from that blood sheet. Okay, so that's a big chunk. Um, you've already seen the images, so there's nothing, on, nothing magical there. So please take a few minutes and just kind of think through that uh, blood study sheet. There also will be on this exam a triple Venn diagram that compares and contrasts skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. We've seen those two in great detail, haven't we? We've seen skeletal muscle. We had a whole chapter on that. We've seen skeletal or cardiac muscle. What we have not discussed very much is smooth muscle. Uh, you know a little bit about it, but I'm going to sh give you three slides today to help you make the comparison between skeletal muscle and smooth. Other things on the exam that you want to focus on will be EKGs. We've seen those in lab. Uh, many of you will either have been quizzed or um, are preparing for a quiz on the Thursday group. And as long as you know the intervals or normal ranges, and you can imagine what's happening in the heart, not only what's going on with the conduction system, but what's physically happening with the heart, um, you know, where it's, what's contracting, what's relaxing, then you'll be fine. It takes a little bit of an internalization, sort of an imagining this whole thing. So you have to almost get a little, I think, get a little video playing in your head of this process happening. And as you read through this, try to imagine it. Because if it's just random facts, then it will just be random facts. Try to make a little story. Try to get a picture kind of going in your head of this whole thing. Uh, make sure you understand um, excitation, contraction coupling. Uh, that's the whole story with the uh, action potential going down the sarcolemma of the muscle and what are the steps with the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum and the troponin C and the tropomycin, that whole story with the actinomycin sliding filaments. And then make sure you're comfortable with the blood cells. And I think that's probably where you're most comfortable. Uh, I would imagine the blood should be a very good part of this exam. You've been tested on it. You've been quizzed on it um, in lab. It's been the oldest material. Um, I think it's probably the most comfortable for you. The skeletal muscle is hopefully also feeling comfortable. And then the cardiac, because we're still in the middle of it, is probably the area that you're least comfortable. Let me say this. I told it to my afternoon group. Next week, we have our third lab exam. That third lab exam covers blood and heart. It's much the same. And in preparation for lab exams in the past, you've had a PAL quiz, right? And you're probably anticipating a PAL quiz in preparation of next week's exam. And I did create one. But while I was creating that quiz, I realized you also, as a group, had not yet been quizzed on this week's lab material. And I always hate walking into an exam if I haven't had a quiz over it, because I'm not sure what to expect. So what I ended up doing is I was making this PAL quiz. It ended up kind of being long. So I posted that quiz. It went live at 4 o'clock. That's going to be a double quiz grade. So it's really one long quiz. It's, it's a quiz to help you get ready for the lab exam. And it's, a, and it's a quiz that gives you some quizzing over what we did this week in lab. If you're struggling at all with EKGs or struggling with any of the cardiovascular blood content, it might be useful for you to take a look at that quiz this week. Take a look at it because there's questions in there, right? And if we, the more questions you see, the more comfortable you become with the material. So in preparation for this exam, if you're feeling uneasy about EKGs or blood, go ahead. Jump over, look at that quiz. It's going to be on the mastering calendar. It won't be due until, quote, next Thursday when the last group takes a lab exam. For Tuesday students, you will have done that before I see you on next Tuesday. That makes sense for everyone? Okay, so just take a look at that. It might help you. Uh, the last thing would be tomorrow night there's a quiz on 
cardio. So you should have two of your three quizzes done and out of the way. There will be in the semester a total of 12 quizzes. And the, only the top 10 will count. So if you missed one or two, uh, a number of you, maybe not the group here, a number of you missed it over the holiday. And yes, I had a quiz due over the holiday. I know that. But just because it's due on the holiday doesn't mean you had to do, wait till the holiday to do it. <laughs> and so um, if you missed it, that's OK. There'll be two quizzes at the end that will be dropped. You can still go in and do the quiz. It just won't count for points. So I encourage you, make sure you go in and look at the quizzes and the homework assignments. Are there any other logistical things for me to be concerned about? I'm about one lecture behind. Um, according to the schedule, I should already be talking about the next content. Uh, so I'm about one lecture behind. That's, that's not too bad uh, this far in the semester. Any concerns, logistical things for me before I move on? I have a question. Sure. The quiz that was due on the 4th of July yes. was due at 4.30. I changed it to midnight. That was a mistake. So anyone who took it after 4.30 and was getting partial credit got full credit. I didn't do it because I thought I wouldn't get credit for it. If I changed it to midnight because that was a mistake. I should have been 11.59. Is there any way that, like, you can only You missed a quiz. It's okay. Um, I mean, there's... 60 people in the class with 120 different excuses as to why they missed a quiz. And so I just make a policy. You get two passes. You, you know, you missed two quizzes for whatever reason. It's okay. Okay. Um, any other logistical concerns? Let's take a look. I, before I forget, actually, I'm going to slide over, and you can tell me what page I'm going to. Just because I told you there's a couple of questions on here about comparing and contrasting smooth muscle. And smooth muscle is most um, formally introduced to you in the digestive system. Because when you think of smooth muscle, what comes to mind? The muscle around your gut, right? So I'm going to jump, and you tell me where I'm going. I'm going to chapter 22 just because it has a couple of slides in here about smooth muscle. This is chapter 22. This will be the digestive system. It's coming up on the next test, and I'm going to 22.4. Can anyone find that for me, please? 22.3. 22.3. And tell me where I am. I want to go through these slides with you briefly. 22.3. No page numbers. So you went over approximately. 22, 22, 22. Um, about 10 pages over, I'm being told. OK, does that make sense? Just so you can follow along. So these, I, I just want to go through this so that you're clear about smooth muscle and you can make those comparisons. If I wait until the next test to ask you these questions, then it won't be as fresh for you. So I want you to be thinking about how these three muscle types compare. So this is 22.3. Um, if you wanted to take a look at this in your book. There's about five or six slides here. Let me just compare this. Uh, again, this will be one of those triple Venn diagrams, so it'll be uh, one circle for skeletal, one circle for muscular, one circle for, for smooth, and I'll give you some facts, and you will tell me to which of the muscle types or to how many of them do these different facts belong. So smooth muscle, it's also called visceral muscle. This is stuff found throughout the body. It forms sheets, it forms bundles, it forms sheets. It goes around tissues. When you think of your gut, when you think of your intestines, when you think of your stomach, uh, part of the bladder, uh, that's what's going on here. And where else do you find smooth muscle? Also in your blood vessels, right? The tunica media, the middle layer of your blood vessels. So it is appropriate in this conversation on the cardiovascular system. And along the way, it is helping to regulate blood flow. It is helping to regulate digestive process. We learned about the sphincters back in 105, you know, the lower esophageal sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, the, um, the anus. Those are all sphincter muscles that are controlled in large part by smooth muscles. And typically throughout the digestive tract, we'll get to that more later, there's two layers in the muscularis. There's that inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. And you know that those two layers of smooth muscle are doing that peristaltic dance, right? And they're helping to squeeze and push food through the digestive system. We'll deal with that in the next test. Right now, what I want you focusing on are just how, and I'm going to skip over this, how is it that smooth muscle is similar or different from cardiac and, and skeletal? That's what you're focusing on right now. So these are relatively long. 
uh, cells, they do contain actinomycin. So all muscle contains actinomycin, folks. Okay. But they're different in that smooth muscle has no T-tubules. What are the T-tubules? They were the, the rabbit holes, right? The T-tubules were the rabbit holes through which the, the signal went down. And as it went down the T-tubule, what was on each side of the T-tubule? Some of the sar sarcoplasmic reticulum with the calcium stores, right? And we know what happens. So there are no T-tubules here. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is more of a loose network that travels all the way through the cell. There are no myofibrils. And there are no sarcomeres. So if there's no sarcomeres, what does that tell us? If there's no sarcomeres, that means that there's no regular overlapping actin and myosin units. Therefore, under the microscope, what do I not see? Striations, right? So I don't see striations because there aren't the regular actin myosin overlapping sections, AKA there are no sarcomeres. So no striations, right? A smooth appearance compared to the striated appearance of skeletal and cardiac muscle. Instead, the thin filaments, right, rather than actinomycin uh, working, they have them, right? But instead, the thin filaments attach to what's called dense bodies. And these are all over the place. They're sort of like the Z lines. What are the Z lines in sarcomeres? From Z to Z, right, is the sarcomere. So the Z line is sort of that end point. So these dense bodies are sort of like the Z lines. And what they're going to do is help to contract. So the smooth muscle is going to contract, but it's not going to contract the way that we saw. Um, the cell will shorten, but it won't shorten in a straight line. In skeletal muscle, you imagine all those myofibrils along the entire length of the cell, all shortening, right? And so everything kind of shortens in a straight line. In smooth muscle, you're going to see that when it contracts, it more like it puckers. It sort of twists, it wiggles, but it doesn't just sh uh, shorten in a straight line. <clears throat> so on the top is a relaxed smooth muscle cell. How would you describe its shape? Mm -hmm. Two little pointy ends, you call it spindly shape, or you could call it fusiform, right? Fusiform in shape. You see a single nucleus that is centrally located. That's different too, isn't it? What do we see in skeletal muscle? The nuclei is multinucleated, and the nuclei are all shoved off to the side because the cytoplasm is filled with myofibrils. So we see that shoving off to the side in both cardiac and uh, skeletal muscle. And here you're seeing at the bottom a contracted smooth muscle cell. So notice it's kind of puckering up. It kind of twists, it wiggles. Um, it doesn't just shorten like you would expect muscle to and the other things we've seen. The last thing I want to tell you is how they are innervated. They are innervated in motor units just like skeletal muscle. Right? So what is that? What's a motor unit again? It's the neuron, the axon, and all of the fibers to which it innervates, right? That's a motor unit. And so it's similar in smooth muscle, but here's what's different. Each cell can be connected to more than one motor neuron. So it's different. It's a different arrangement. In skeletal muscle, right, one neuron, one cell, right, or one, one muscle cell is only connected to one axon, one neuron. But here we see that there is multiple. Um, and where do we find this stuff? Do you agree that the iris of your eye, right, is smooth muscle? And um, what cranial nerve was controlling that? What cranial nerve caused you to constrict your pupil? Remember that was number three, ocular motor. And uh, portion of the male reproductive system, um, We've got the walls of large arteries. We've got the erector pili. You know where smooth muscle is located. Lastly, um, there are electrical connections. There are electrical synapses. And so what do electrical synapses sound like? What other muscle has electrical synapses? Cardiac, right? So cardiac electrical synapses are traveling through intercalated discs, right? And so here, we also have um, electrical synapses. And that means that the cells can wave as a single unit. We might call that a syncytium, right? So all the cells kind of act as a single unit. 
as a syncytium. And there are many ways that smooth muscle can be controlled in skeletal muscle, right? We don't have hormones controlling your skeletal muscle. And you don't have um, chemicals really controlling your skeletal muscle. But in smooth muscle, it can be changed by a number of things. You can have hormone signals, chemical signals, and neurotransmitters. Lastly, there are pacemaker cells, pace setter cells in smooth muscle, just like the heart, right? The heart has the SA node and the AB node that set the pace. So too, smooth muscle does. Your gut is doing peristalsis at a set rate, right? There's a, there's a rate at which these are, are contracting sort of as an intrinsic rate, just like the heart has an intrinsic rate, so too does smooth muscle. So this is going to keep digestive products moving. This is going to keep blood flowing. It's going to help in a little peristalsis dance. And this is the last uh, two slides. So what do we have here is a little cartoon of this. And what we see is over here, here's a smooth muscle cell. Oops. Here's a smooth muscle cell. And what do you notice? This smooth muscle cell is touching this neuron and this neuron. Right, so there's multiple neurons touching these smooth muscle cells. And this is sort of the way that it works. Um, it's just a different sort of architecture, a different sort of wiring for smooth muscle. We'll talk more about this when we get to the digestive system, but I just want you to see some major issues here. And then lastly, we would say that smooth muscle has plasticity. Um, which means that it can change a lot. It, can, it has a lot of, pla like it, if the brain is very plastic, right, it means it can change, it can adapt. Same thing is true with smooth muscle. It can stretch and it can relax, and it's not like the heart. Uh, who is it that said that the more the heart stretches, the more it contracts? Two dudes, hyphenated name, right? Frank Starling, right? The Frank Starling law says that the heart will kind of do the work that it needs to do, and as you put more heart, more uh, preload, what's preload? Preload, the amount of basically how much the muscle is stretching, right? So the more blood that comes into the ventricle, the more the muscle is going to stretch. That's preload, and with greater preload, what does the heart do? It contracts with more force. So that's a, you know similar in smooth muscle, but smooth muscle doesn't always contract. It's able to squeeze and and change its shape a little bit more, so it's more plastic. It can function over a wider range of lengths, which you can imagine as food is traveling through your digestive system, right, after a meal, your smooth muscle must be able to stretch to allow that food to travel through and then to recoil. And that's it. So that was just a little bit, just a little bit of reminder about how smooth muscle is a little bit different from skeletal or cardiac muscle. And we'll jump back now to chapter 19. 22.3, that's where we were on smooth muscle. So we were picking up here on the section three, and we're going to be talking about cardiac output. You've seen a little bit of that in lab, or you will this week some more. We're also going to be talking about uh, resistance of flow, and we're also going to be going into regulation of blood pressure and chemo and baroreceptors. So that's where we're heading. Uh, we've got a fair amount of material to do, but it's, I think all of this rest of the stuff makes really good sense. It's not, it's not the real detailed stuff that we've had. It's not like we're dealing with the intricacies of an EKG. We're not dealing with the intricacies of the um, conduction system, but now we're kind of trying to figure out how this whole thing works. And I'll try to review as I'm going through this as much of the previous content as possible. So what is cardiac output? Cardiac output. What's the equation for cardiac output? Heart rate times stroke volume. Really quick, what is stroke volume? It's the amount of blood being pumped out with each and every squeeze of the ventricles. And are the right and left ventricles, do they have the same stroke volume? Do the right and left ventricles have the same stroke volume? Yes, they have to. I mean, that's part of the mystery of the heart, is that in order for the circulatory system to maintain its control, it has to be pumping the same out of the right side as it does out of the left side, even though the left side's under greater pressure. 
the volume is going to be essentially the same, right, in left sides. It has to be. Well, how do we define stroke volume? Stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped out each and every time. How would we make an equation with stroke volume? It's E dV and diastolic volume minus ESV. And what are we saying? It's the amount of blood before the heart pumps and the difference after it pumps. And the amount of, that it pumps out, the ejection that it pops out, is the stroke volume. Now, what were the things that could increase or what can things could modify? Not increase, but what things could modify stroke volume? What could modify or change stroke volume? Give me two or three things. Venous blood flow back in. So if the EDV is greater, more blood's coming back in to the ventricle, then you would expect your stroke volume to be higher, okay? That would increase um, stroke volume. What would decrease stroke volume? Afterload. What is afterload? Afterload was the resistance to pumping. So the more difficult it is for the heart to pump, the less blood you would expect it to push out. And what one disease would increase afterload? Atherosclerosis, right? So what's that doing is it's making the lumen of the vessels smaller, increasing the pressure, making it more difficult for the blood to be pushed out. That would be an increase in afterload, and that would decrease, yes, decrease stroke volume. One more thing that would increase stroke volume, increase. Preload, pre okay, uh, massive preload, and that's right. Um, preload is the stretch of the heart, and just before that we said that increased venous return and end diastolic volume increasing would also, so those are very similar, aren't they? Do you agree? Mm -hmm. More volume in the, in the ventricle means greater preload greater stretch of the muscle. But there's one more thing I'm looking for specifically that is going to increase. Okay, it, yeah, yeah, you're too smart. Um, two things. One more, th what I'm looking for right now that's going to increase stroke volume. How hard the heart is squeezing, contractility. If the, sque if the heart is squeezing more forcefully, would you expect it to squeeze more blood out? So the greater the contractility, the greater the stroke volume. Now, back to Jade's question or comment about heart rate. It would influence it, wouldn't it? If heart rate is really slow, what would there be more time for? Filling. And with more filling, there would be a greater EDV, and that would increase stroke volume. What if heart rate was really high? And we'll talk about this in lab tonight and on Thursday. If heart rate's really, really high, what well, would there not be adequate time for? Filling. Therefore, EDV would drop. Stroke volume would go down. And overall cardiac output would go down. If what I've just said sounds like a bunch of gibberish, go back and listen. Okay? Because all the things I just said are kind of like on one of those charts, kind of an overview of stroke volume and heart rate and cardiac output. And you need to be able to push the little up and down arrows here and think about what's happening. So if this didn't make sense, go back and listen to the first uh, 20 minutes or so, or the minute 15 to 23. Um, with the um, increased heart rate, isn't it when it beats faster, it also beats harder? So okay, the, the would question would be, okay, so Stacy's question, she said, if the heart beats faster, doesn't it also beat stronger, right? And yes, under normal conditions, under exercise, with a normal healthy heart, yes, to a point. Yes, you can increase the heart rate, and under sympathetic surge, epinephrine causes the heart to also squeeze harder, and that vastly drives up your cardiac output. But in a diseased heart, or with an aging heart, right, past prime, what happens? The heart is beating faster to make up for the decreased stroke volume, and the reason an older heart has a decreased stroke volume is because it typically, with age, comes higher blood pressure. Higher blood pressure leads to higher afterload. Afterload requires the heart to work harder to push the blood out. That's going to 
any muscle that works harder is going to hypertrophy, right? It's going to get bigger. And I've said to you that a bigger heart is less efficient and therefore drives stroke volume down. Okay, so we got all these little up and down arrows to be thinking about. And um, this will be a multiple choice test, so it's not like I'm going to say put all of these things into one sentence or uh, tell me how all these things interact in the chart. But in a, mind, in a way, you have to have that story going on in your head because there'll be some questions and you'll need to be able to think about what's going on. Under normal conditions. Under normal conditions. You can almost say that they're inversely related, slightly. What's like, almost really inversely? Uh, heart rate versus time stroke volume. As we think about just normal aging, heart rate will go up because stroke volume does go down. Absolutely. In, in just the general sequence of life. Heart rate will slowly go up and stroke volume will go down such that cardiac output stays the same. Because your brain, your kidneys, your liver, all your tissues still need as much oxygen as they needed, you know, as a child as they do now as an adult. So we need to keep cardiac output essentially the same. Yes. Okay. So that was a long commercial when I saw that word cardiac output. Okay. So why do we need sufficient cardiac output? Why do we have to keep it steady, essentially, throughout our resting life? Because all of our, our brain liver, kidney, they need to maintain a certain amount of blood flow and therefore oxygen and nutrients. And if we don't have enough cardiac output, then we wouldn't have enough pressure to get the blood where it needs to go. Now the amount of blood that goes to a tissue, you'll hear the word perfusion. The, the tissue is well perfused and um, that's what you're looking for. You want a good distribution of nutrients. If there isn't sufficient cardiac output, then we know the kidneys get upset, right, if they don't have enough blood pressure. Because remember we said the kidneys have a regulator on there. They start secreting renin when the blood pressure drops. So we know the kidneys are upset when the pressure drops. The brain, we're going to talk about the brain in a few minutes. And we also know when the pressure is too high, what does the heart do? The heart puts out atrial natriuretic peptide, right? So we know the heart is also a hormonally regulating blood pressure in part. So we've got both hormonal and nervous system controls that are maintaining the homeostasis of the heart. And we talked about them. We know sympathetic, parasympathetic. Right? It's going to increase and decrease the heart rate neurologically. Hormonally, we've got AMP. We've got renin. We've got angiotensin. We've talked about some of these um, as a more global, holistic idea. And all of those nervous signals and hormonal signals are really affecting, again, back to heart rate and stroke volume. And they're also including or in, in, uh, affecting your blood pressure. So all of this is connected, beautifully connected. So what is blood pressure, folks? In lab this week, you'll measure blood pressure. You'll have the opportunity to pull out a sphincter and a cuff and, and actually uh, perform blood pressure on each other. But what is blood pressure? the amount of pressure on the inside of your vessels. And we can't directly measure that, so instead we have to use right, the method of blood pressure, which is an approximation, it's a pretty good one, a pretty good approximation. You know that atrial pressure, right, uh, within the hole, atrial pressure is much higher than venous pressure, okay? Don't get the word atrial and arterial. So I just messed up, atrial, and arterial. I just said atrial, didn't I? I just messed up. So this is arterial pressure, right? Um, the pressure of the arteries is much higher than venous pressure, the pressure of your veins. Don't let the word arterial and atrial flip in your head. And we know that the pressure in your arteries must be much greater because it's having to push the blood up and out of the aorta through all of your large vessels and eventually to all of your capillaries. That's a lot of surface area. By the time you push blood out your aorta to all of your capillaries, that's a tremendous amount of surface area, and you've got to have sufficient pressure to push it all through. Now, what's going to be, what are the factors here? We'll talk about blood pressure a little bit, but another one is resistance. Flow of blood through blood vessels is influenced by resistance. The greater the resistance, the, well, how's that going to affect flow? Yeah, flow is going to go down if resistance goes up. Right? It's an inverse relationship. 
flow will be greater with less resistance. Flow will be less with greater resistance. And we'll see that resistance increases as vessels get smaller. Imagine that you're trying to pump blood through a big hose versus a smaller hose. So as you're pumping it through a smaller hose, right, the pressure is going to go up. So we'll, we'll see that as we push through this. Now, blood flow in your capillaries is very slow. Tell me why. We need blood to stay in your capillaries long enough for what to happen? Exchange. Gas exchange, but also hormones, nutrients, water, waste products. All of the stuff that goes from your cells into your blood vessels is exchanging at the capillaries. And there has to be time for all of that business to occur. So if your blood was going through your capillaries too quickly, there would not be adequate time for those exchanges to occur. We'll talk about that when we get to the respiratory system and how emphysema and other diseases affect gas exchange in the alveoli of the lungs. Um, so you need to have time for that diffusion. Now, what is that diffusion? Where is it? When you're at the capillary, where are you diffusing? You're diffusing from the blood, from the plasma, out into the interstitial fluid, the fluid around the cells. And then, so we know that the pressure in the arteries is very high. We know that the flow of blood through the capillaries is very slow and low pressure, right? In the capillaries, not very much pressure. Because remember, what is the structure of a capillary? What's around the outside of a capillary? Is there any muscle? No, there's no muscle, right? So what is it that's holding a capillary together? Just simple squamous. And the other name for that layer is the endothelium, or you could call the layer the tunica intima. But it's very delicate. So you know the pressure going through a capillary is very low, and the time is rather extended. That you want nice, slow flow under low pressure going through the capillaries. And then, overall, you also have to keep your blood pressure maintained in the veins. But how are veins much different? Veins do not have a thick layer of smooth muscle. They are very, very thin-walled. So they tend to collapse when they're empty. And they're not pumping the blood. They're not able to squeeze the blood. Veins cannot squeeze to push the blood back to the heart. So how does blood get back to the heart? If the artery, if, sorry, the veins can't squeeze, there's three or four things that bring blood back. What are they? Muscle, Muscle contraction, especially the lower legs, are going to push that blood up through the leg. Any movement you do with your arms is also going to assist. But gravity is your friend, right, for the head and the arms more so, you've got a greater gravity issue with the legs. And so we've got the movement of your leg muscles is going to be squeezing those veins. Number two, the valves of the vein, of the valves are also going to help. Your medium-sized veins, the ones like your, your great saphenous and your femoral veins, those one coming up from the leg have valves in them. And those valves, if they're properly working, are going to make sure that Blood only goes in one direction. Now, those valves can go bad. And what would be the symptoms of faulty valves? Varicose veins, Varicose veins and or swollen ankles, right? Because what's happening is that the blood is, is no longer moving in one direction. It's tending to fall back down. So these individuals would usually have puffier ankles and would have more varicose veins because those valves are, are default, defective and fluid is building up. And who would be more prone for these varicose veins? Women, in general, true. And standing still, right? A lot of standing still, uh, not moving around, because that pressure builds up and those little valves get weak. Okay, increases the varicose veins. And one other thing that increases, two more things that increase blood flow back to the heart. Not only the movement of your legs and muscles, but also the breathing. So every time you breathe, your diaphragm is contracting, your thoracic cavity is changing its pressure, and that pressure change also helps to pull blood 
back up into your inferior vena cava. And then finally, the heart is a pump, but that means not only is it pushing blood out, it's also sucking blood back in. And so the suction of this closed system also contributes. And if the heart has to work harder, right? If someone doesn't exercise, someone doesn't breathe deeply, someone's not moving around a lot, that means the heart has to work harder to get the blood back to the heart. And what happens to a muscle that works harder? It's bigger. And here we go, right? So with less exercise, um, the heart has to work harder, and that begins to cause the muscle to get larger. Stroke volume will become less efficient and, and go down. Heart rate will have to go up to compensate. And you begin to see how this whole story starts to make good common sense, right? What's the best thing you can do for your heart? Move, breathe, you know, just move. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just move and breathe deeply. So even deep breathing, yoga, all that kind of stuff is also very important for your heart. Venous return is simply the amount of blood arriving at the right atrium each minute. This should be the same as what? If all is balanced, venous return, the amount of blood coming into the right atrium, should be the same as cardiac output, what's going out the left. Do you agree? I mean, what comes in should be what goes out. So venous return, cardiac output should be balanced if the heart is healthy. But if for some reason the heart was not healthy, or let's say you're just beginning to exercise, then clearly they may not be the same, right? But in a normal homeostatic balance situation at rest, venous return and cardiac output should be the same. So we're just looking at a little picture here, and we're reminding ourselves of all the ways that the body maintains blood pressure. So we've got neuro and hormonal control. We know some of those hormones, right? ANH, renin, uh, sympathetic. We've got epinephrine, norepinephrine. And that is definitely going to have an impact on cardiac output, which has an, you know, which is influenced by blood pressure, which is clearly influenced by resistance. Uh, the smaller the lumen, the greater the pressure. And all of this is also connecting to the pressure and the return of blood back to the heart. So this is all one beautiful story. So in blood pressure medicine, is it common to have like a vasodilator? Uh, a blood pressure medication could be, um, you're asking about a vasodilator, that would reduce your pressure, wouldn't it? But it would only do so much. Typically, they're going to be um, um, angiotensin ACE inhibitors. And we'll, we haven't talked about ACE yet. We, it came by in passing. We'll talk about it in the respiratory system. But ACE inhibitors are going to interfere with that renin aldosterone angiotensin pathway and are going to reduce. Because what happens with renin? It causes your body to increase pressure. So if we can block that pathway, typically you'll keep a person's pressure down. So those ACE inhibitors are usually the number one uh, attempt. And we'll talk again, that'll come up again in cardiovascular system. I had a question earlier today about the final exam. And it says in the syllabus that it'll be about 25% cumulative, right? And there's a good example of, of a cumulative kind of question. Right now, we're talking about blood pressure. But when we get to the respiratory system, I'll mention ACE inhibitors and how it might influence blood pressure. And those questions, those big global questions, those big connections between systems would be the kinds of questions that I'll be focusing on on the final exam. It's not going to be nitpicky, um, but it's going to be just the big ideas between systems. So I think the, the cumulative portion of the final is not something you're going to be, you're not going to be going back and looking through your notes specifically for every little detail, and I'll help you with that when we get close to the end. So let's measure peripheral resistance. Resistance. Now, another way of saying this would be an increase in peripheral resistance would be an increase in afterload, right? We got those words kind of connected. So the greater the resistance to the blood pumping through the body, this is peripheral resistance. And you have to have sufficient pressure to overcome this peripheral resistance. In other words, the heart has to be able to over, overcome, and that would increase the afterload. Now, three things that increase or affect peripheral resistance. Number one, the resistance of the vessels themselves. Number two, viscosity. What's another word for viscosity? Thickness, right? How thick something is. And finally, turbulence. So let me go through each of these with you. Number one, vascular resistance is simply the opposition, the opposition to blood flow in your vessels. I've already said, what would, it, what would 
what disease would decrease flow? Atherosclerosis. And where does atherosclerosis usually occur? What kind of arteries? Big ones or little ones? It is more devastating. It is more common for atherosclerosis to be a problem in the big elastic arteries. The big ones. So what are the big ones? The ones under the greatest pressure. Aorta, common iliac, right? The big ones, um, carotid going up the neck, and renal. Um, renal, I mean, the kidneys get a lot of pressure, right? More than you would expect, but they get a lot of pressure coming off the aorta. So those are the big ones. This is the big one. Um, and this is basically a friction that builds up between the blood and the walls of the vessel. Now, two things that affect friction would be the vessel's length and the vessel's diameter. Let's think about it. If the vessel is bigger around, resistance would be lower. If the vessel is smaller, then resistance would be increased. So we'll see that conversation. And then vessel length. Now, vessel length is not as much of a deal for you and me because our cardiovascular system, our arteries and veins are kind of where they are. We're not sprouting new arteries of significant length. So the length of our vessels is really essentially constant, not something that we're going to be worrying about here. Yes, it's changing from birth up until uh, puberty, if you will, but it's really not something that's drastically changing moment to moment. So if you increase the length of a vessel, do you agree that you would increase the surface area? So if I had a, a, a hose twice as long, that means I've increased the surface area twice as much, and that would also increase the friction because it's the, it's the um, blood up against the vessel that's increasing this resistance or friction. So just as an, a, a picture of this, if I had a short, uh, a short hose, vessel, hose, however you want to think about it, versus a long hose, um, the resistance is twice as much in a longer hose, everything else being the same. Right? The resistance is twice as much in a longer hose. And so the flow, which is inversely related. So what's going to happen to the flow in the longer hose? I got a short hose and a long hose. The short hose has less resistance, therefore greater flow. The longer one has twice as much resistance, therefore decreased flow. OK, and look at the numbers. It tells us that. So the, the resistance to flow is just set as a number of one. I'm doubling that resistance because the tube is twice as long. And if I increase the resistance, then the flow decreases. This is an inverse relationship. Again, flow and resistance are inversely related. The other thing is diameter. Now, the greater the diameter, what's going to happen to flow? Let's turn around. The, the smaller the vessel, is that more or less resistance? Small blood vessel. Pressure's increased. Blood is interacting with the sidewall more. So there'd be more resistance in a small vessel, a large vessel. Think of a big hose, right? There's not much resistance there. There's a mathematical relationship here. And here's just a picture of this. Greatest resistance is near the surface. Least resistance is at the center. So if you just had blood traveling through a tube and it was interacting with the inside of the tube, it would have greater resistance. If it was traveling right down the center of the tube, right, it would have little to no resistance because it's not interacting with the side walls of the tube. So this is more like a physics lesson here, isn't it? The relationship here is 1 over r to the 4. This is the number you got to keep in mind. Basically says this. As I change the diameter of the tube, as I change the diameter of tube, the resistance is 1 over the fourth power of the radius. Where does the greatest control of blood flow come? At 
the aorta, or in little arterioles. Little arterioles. I, I, I'll say this again in lab, and I'll say it now. If, oh, as you look at an arteriole, you still see a lot of muscle around it. That muscle is the control mechanism so that during a sympathetic surge, more blood goes to your muscles and less blood goes to your gut. What is it that controls that? When you're by the campfire and you're in parasympathetic more, then less blood flow goes to your muscles and more blood flow goes to your digestive system. That regulation of flow is at the arterioles. So all the arterioles have to do is just increase and decrease their diameter, their radius just a little bit, and it has a dramatic effect on flow. So that's where I want you to think about this, dramatic effect. So a very, very small change in the diameter of an arteriole can produce a very significant change in the overall resistance. So take a look at this. I've got a tube, a blood vessel, a hose, that has a diameter of two centimeters, and the resistance is set here to one. But if I cut that in half, right, I've reduced the diameter, also reduced the radius, right, by half, then what's going to happen? The resistance goes to 16. What happened here? What's my relationship here? How did I get 16? What is 2 to the 4? 16. These are easy numbers here, right? 2 to the 4th power. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So 1 to the 4th power is what? Right? And, I, and I've decreased this so that my resistance just increased by a factor of 16. So what you're seeing here is that an arterial only has to change a little bit to have a very dramatic effect on resistance. And the greater the resistance change, the greater the effect on flow. All of that's changing at the arterioles in that smooth muscle layer. Now, another thing that can change the peripheral resistance is viscosity. Again, this is not a major issue in normal situations. Now, what if a person's polycythemic, though? And high altitudes, what might happen? If you have a really abnormally high number of red blood cells and you have polycythemia, your hematocrit's really high, what would happen to the thickness of your blood? It would go up, right? It would be thicker. But that doesn't happen very often. So viscosity of your blood is not a major player. You can appreciate, right, that if, if the blood is thicker, then it's going to be more difficult to move. If it's thinner, it's going to be easier to move through the tubes. But our blood thickness, our viscosity, really does not change that much. So it's not a major consideration. Just like I told you, length of our vessels is not a major consideration, so too viscosity is normally not a major consideration for our blood which means that the number one thing that changes our flow of blood is what? Diameter, right? We're back to diameter and radius of the tube is what is so important in regulating it. Now, blood is about five times more viscous than water, yes, but it's pretty much stable. You'd have to have some very significant disorder. And even if you went up to Denver for a couple of days and for a moment your hematocrit went above normal, it would restore, it would, it would come back to normal. So it's not going to be a major issue in everyday situations. Question? So would, would viscosity, would, that would be more like it's harder to suck a milkshake through a straw. It is. It's harder to suck a milkshake through a straw. There's greater resistance. Therefore, it's more difficult and flow would go down. Right? If you're pouring molasses or ketchup out of a bottle, it pours a lot less fast, a lot less faster, um, a lot slower than something that's more watery. So again, the greater the viscosity, and this just kind of gives you an idea of this. Um, Water, set at one. Blood, five times greater right, than water. But maple syrup, motor oil, molasses, you know, you get the idea. Thicker stuff would move more slowly. The last one would be turbulence. And this is the irregular 
patterns. As blood travels through your vessels, if there is um, irregular surfaces, if there are sudden changes in vessel diameter, that would create some turbulence. But normally, blood is going to flow quite well through your vessels. But if there was something that was very irregular, this could be, for example, if you had atherosclerosis, right? And all of a sudden, your vessels are kind of moving along, and all of a sudden, there's a big plaque buildup, then that could be a dramatic change at that location, at that intersection, and turbulence would increase. And if turbulence increases, then your flow would go down. But again, normally, this is not a major player. So here is an example of plaque sitting in a vessel. And you can imagine the blood's coming in from the left, and everything's good. Flow is normal. And all of a sudden, there's this restriction, right? this squeezing down of the lumen. And that would cause some, some flow restriction, uh, restriction, right? Makes sense. So the flow would go down as a result of this disturbance, this turbulence in the vessel. So number one, number one, number one is diameter. Diameter. The other ones are talked about, controlled for, and relatively constant. So blood flow is proportional to blood pressure. Do you agree? More pressure, the greater the flow. Blood flow is inversely related to resistance. Yes? There is a tremendous gradient. Um, we know that when you think about diffusion, what is diffusion? The movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. That, we've got that. We've got that mantra down. We can kind of imagine that. The same is true for fluids moving through a tube. Fluids will not move unless there is a pressure gradient. Not a concentration gradient, but a pressure gradient. If you've got water sitting in a, in a hose, Right? and the hose is just sitting there, and there's nothing pushing it through, the water is just going to sit there. Right? So there has to be a pressure gradient. There has to be something pushing the blood through the blood vessel. Well, that's what the heart does. Right? It pushes it, and it pushes it under great pressure at the aorta. That pressure does what as we go through? It's going to drop and drop and drop. It's dropping for two reasons. It's dropping because we're going further away from the source of the pressure, but what else is happening? As you go from the aorta, and then you split, aortic arch has three branches off it, and then you go off the aorta, and you get all these little branches coming off. What's happening? As you go further and further away from the heart, the surface area is increasing. And that means that the overall pressure is going to decrease. So the further you go away from the heart, the more surface area that blood now has to fill. And when you get down to the capillaries, you've got you know, hundreds more spaces, if you will, to fill with that blood. And so the pressure definitely drops down. And then we talked about getting it back. So from the heart to the capillaries, what's pushing the blood? Pressure from the aorta, basically. Once we get past the capillaries, what's pushing the blood? There's no longer something pushing. There is instead something now basically pu pushing more from the, pushing the veins up, the valves, the breathing, and the sucking of the heart. But it's a different kind of pressure gradient, isn't it? Okay. Again, the big thing is diameter. Changes in diameter are going to be critical here. So from the aorta to the capillaries, like I just said, we're pushing. The blood vessels are diverging. They're branching. The overall diameter is increasing. Sorry, decreasing diameter, right? The vessels are getting smaller, so the aorta and then going down to the brachial artery, then going down to arterioles. The diameter is decreasing, but there's also going to be a decrease in the pressure and a decrease in the flow. Remember I told you at the capillaries, flow is nice and slow, nice and slow. And from the capillaries back through the vena cava, then we're converging, so we're increasing the diameter. As you increase the diameter as it comes back, you're decreasing the resistance, and this actually increases the flow. Make sense? In other words, the, the, the speed at which blood leaves the heart has to match the speed at which blood comes back to the heart, yes? Right. So as the heart is pumping blood out under force, as much blood must be coming back into the heart with as much, not as much force, but as much volume. 
So as we go further away from the heart in arteries, the area is increasing and pressure goes down. As we come back to the heart, the speed of blood actually has to speed back up, doesn't it? So we're going from very slow through the capillaries, and then we're actually picking up speed as we come back to the vena cava, because overall, our area is reducing, and that's going to push things faster through. So we've already said this, the greatest pressure is at the aorta. We know that. Average pressure, about 120. That 120 would be what? The diastolic or the systolic? Systolic, that is the pressure of contraction. So that's the greater pressure. And the pressure drops and drops and drops. And by the time you get down to the capillaries, it's down. Some figures will show 40. This is saying around 35, but it's appreciably lower. And by the time you leave the capillaries and enter into the venules, you're down to around 20, 18 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And then by the time you get back to the vena cava, you are essentially zero. So here's a, a picture of this. At the very top, we've got the vessel diameter. So at the very beginning, of course, we've got the big, strong, elastic arteries, big diameter. Two and a half centimeters, right? How big is that? Two and a half centimeters is an inch. We've got an inch around. That's a big old tube. It's a big old garden hose coming out the heart. So the vena cava and the aorta are about an inch around. And then as you come through the arteries and go to the, the capillaries, there's a drop, very small diameter in the capillaries. And then again, as you come back to the heart, the diameter of the vena cava is once again increasing. The pressure, again, we've, I've talked about this. We see pressure highest at the aorta and then precipitously dropping around 35 to 40 at the beginning of the capillaries. 18 to 20 or so as you leave the capillaries into the venules, and essentially zero, close to it, by the time you get through the vena cava back to the heart. And then uh, this is the velocity. The velocity sort of follows the, um, sort of follows the, the top picture, that you've got really fast, this is uh, centimeters per second, how much blood is going out the flow, and it drops, and then it does come back up. It doesn't quite recover, but, but almost so. And the reason it doesn't have to recover is the vena cava are what? Not as muscular, and therefore are more prone to stretch, and that would do what? That means that more blood can come through at lower pressure, and then the amount of blood going out. So you don't see it quite recover, right? It doesn't quite recover to the same pressure, but that's a difference in the diameter of the aorta versus the diameter of the vena cava. So let's talk about blood pressure a little bit. Uh, average, again, 120 over 80. Uh, you write that. The systolic is over the diastolic. The systolic is the pressure on the vessels at contraction. The diastolic is the pressure on the vessels at rest. Pulse pressure is the difference. This is a new term for most of you. Pulse pressure is the difference in the systolic and the diastolic. Just subtract them. So if you have a pressure of 120 over 90, the pulse pressure is 30. OK, what is that? Let's make common sense of this. If you're going to take one's pulse, what are you feeling? Right? I'm going to take the pulse. So radial pulse coming down the radial artery. Where are we? Kind of on the thumb side of everything. When you push your finger on your radial artery, what are you feeling? Pulse. You're feeling your arteries expand and, re and recoil. How strong your pulse is is related to your pulse pressure. The greater the difference in the arterial, the greater the difference in the systolic and the diastolic, the greater your pulse would feel, yes? So that pulse pressure, make, just make sense of that. It's the pressure that creates your pulse. Then there's the mean arterial pressure, and there's an equation for this. It's simply take one-third of your pulse pressure and add it to your diastolic. So we did a nice, easy example here. If your pressure is 120 over 90, am I worried about 120 over 90? 90 is at the 
high end, but still considered you know, over 90 you're in concern. But 120 over 90, um, pulse pressure is 30. The mean arterial pressure would be one third of the pulse pressure. That's easy, right? That's just um, 10, and add that now to the diastolic. So you'd have a, an MAP, a mean arterial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, why, why do you think they call this the mean? If 120 over 90 is your pressure, why is the MAP closer to the diastolic than it is the systolic? This is your mean pressure. Mean, right? Pressure, average. Why is the MAP closer to the diastolic than to the systolic? If your pressure is 120 over 90 and your MAP is 100. The heart spends longer in diastole than it does in systole. So your average pressure would be closer, do you agree? closer to the diastolic because your heart spends more time in relaxation than it does in the contractile phases. So as you look at this, where do you have a significant pulse? This graph is showing you the systolic and the diastolic up and down, up and down, up and down. And that means that your arteries would have a pulse, right? There's a pulse pressure. There's a difference in the top and the bottom. But what's going to happen when you get down and you enter into your capillaries? Is there any longer a pulse pressure? The systolic and the diastolic are now essentially the same. So 30 minus 30 is zero. So the pulse pressure here is essentially zero, meaning that the blood that goes into your capillaries is not going in pulsing. It's simply dripping in at a constant, nice, slow speed. So are you going to feel a pulse in your capillaries? If you could touch your capillaries, would you feel a pulse? No. Would you feel a pulse in your veins? No. Do you feel, I mean, you touch your veins in your, life, in your arm. Do you feel a pulse? Why? There's no difference. Look, at, it's a flat line, right? We don't see a pulsing difference between systolic and diastolic because there is no longer any pressure pushing this stuff through. So you're not going to feel a pulse in a capillary, you're not going to feel a pulse in a vein. You're only going to feel a pulse from your arteries. I've told you that the flow of blood through a capillary must be slow, long enough for diffusion of nutrients and gases to exchange and hormones to do their thing. All of that exchange must happen, water exchange. That means that there's going to be a capillary hydrostatic pressure, CHP. All that means is the pressure in your capillary beds. Okay, don't make this hard. It's just the pressure in your capillary beds, CHP. And there has to be a certain amount of pressure to get the blood through, but again, we don't want it too high. This same pressure, though, is what's going to help push water out. Remember from 105, the mantra of lab two was solutes suck. And there's a certain amount of water that's going to be exchanging from your plasma out to your interstitial fluid. We'll talk more about our next chapter. Well, I think it's going to be either lymphatic or digestive. And you're going to learn more about this interchange of materials at the capillary beds and how fluid moves from the, from the um, blood vessels into the interstitial fluid. And remember, the interstitial fluid is the same as your lymph. It's the same stuff. And so there has to be a certain amount of, of push through your vessels. But what is it that keeps water in your blood? Why doesn't it all leave? Because of the solute concentration. And what are the major solutes in blood? Proteins. And the most abundant protein in your blood is albumins. So albumins accounting for 65 or so, 70% of all of your blood. And you've heard me say before that albumin is the major water controlling protein. There's so much of it. Albumins are small and they're very abundant. And so really it's your albumins that control much of your blood pressure when it comes to the fluid leaving at the capillaries. What organ makes the albumin? All of your blood cell, all of your blood proteins are made where? In the liver? If you have liver damage, what happens to 
your ability to maintain fluid levels in your blood. If you've got liver damage, you're not making enough albumin. If you're not making enough albumin, that means that the solutes aren't there to suck the water in, so more water is going to leave your vessels, and that water is going to accumulate much in your gut, and you're going to have what they call ascites. So ascites is a fluid buildup on the gut okay, from liver damage. Okay. So just get, make some of these connections. Make some of these connections. So we see here that there's a pressure, this CHP, this capillary hydrostatic pressure. And you're looking at the top. This is your blood vessel. And at the bottom is your interstitial fluid. And you can see that this pressure is helping to push molecules through. Now, we've got diffusion, high concentration to low concentration. But there's also a small amount of push here that's going on that's going to help provide this exchange. In capillaries, the endothelial cells are just a simple squamous, right, very thin layer of cells. And so they're a little bit delicate. And so it's possible with enough pressure to push molecules in between the cells. And that's going to help increase the exchange of molecules here. So let's talk about what happens at the capillaries. We've got diffusion. We've got that. Movement from higher concentration to low concentration. What did we learn also back in 105 when we did that diffusion lab with the four different dyes? We had, what did we have? Uh, potassium permanganate, methylene blue, Congo red. We had those four different dyes. Remember that little Petri dish plate thing we did? I know it's vividly haunting you. Um, do you remember, too, that the diffusion, it went up fast and then it started to plateau? We never really went too far out to see a plateau. What does that tell us about diffusion? Diffusion is pretty fast in a short distance, but as the distance increases, the rate of diffusion is going to go down. So diffusion is great for short distances. Diffusion is great if there's a significant concentration gradient. And diffusion is fantastic if the ions and molecules are themselves quite small. Okay. And that describes most of the things that happen at the capillary. We've got a very short distance. We've got a significant concentration difference. And the molecules are small. So di diffusion's great. But if the molecules aren't that small, or the concentration gradient isn't that big, or the distances gets increased, then diffusion is no longer the best way to exchange. Then there might be some active transport or some other mechanisms in place. So again, small things, water, small ions, small molecules, glucose, amino acids. We'll get to urea when we get to the kidneys. We'll see that those things easily move back and forth. Sodium moves pretty well. But big things can't, right? Bigger molecules can't move across the capillary, which is good, which means albumin and other proteins should not be moving just the small molecules as a result. So this filtration that occurs, I want you to imagine a capillary. And I'm going to draw this. Uh, here's the capillary. Here's the arteriole. We're coming into the capillary. And then the capillary goes into a capillary bed. Okay, This is just my really horrible drawing. And then we always picture what happens. Gas exchange, so we always say that the you know, oxygen dropped off, CO2 got picked up, and then all of that drains back into a venule, right? So this end of the capillary up here, we're going to call the arterial end of the capillary. It's the artery side of the capillary. The blood there is more oxygenated. There, would you agree, is where the greatest CHP is. We know that the pressure is like 20, 30 or so, 35, 40, going into a capillary bed. And what happens as it comes out of the capillary bed? It's even lower. So the pressure is greater at the arterial end. What's that going to do? If the pressure is greater at the arterial end, it's going to push even more small molecules in water out into the interstitium. Yes? And that's filtration. There's going to be a lot of movement of stuff out from the plasma into the interstitial fluid. Those proteins aren't going to leave, but we're going to have quite a bit of water leaving, but the proteins will stay behind. And what happens here 
It is also a blood colloid osmotic pressure. Remember that word? We had that somewhere else, didn't we? Colloid pressure the very, very first week or so with water regulation. And the colloid pressure was basically, in this situation, think of albumin. And as long as there's lots of albumin and the solutes are sucking, that is the colloid pressure. It is the, it's the sucking of the solutes to keep the water in the capillary. So we have this CHP is greater than the BCOP, okay? It's greater than the blood colloid osmotic pressure. Now, at this point, there is the net filtration pressure, the NFP. And all this is, is the difference, CHP minus BCOP. It's the difference between the hydrostatic and the colloid pressures. As long as CHP is bigger, what's going to happen? What's going, to be, what's going to be happening if the capillary pressure is greater than the colloid pressure? Then you're going to have more water and molecules pushed out into the interstitium. But what's going to happen at the venous side of the capillary bed? What do you think? What's happening down there at the other end? What happens to the concentration of albumin as blood travels through a capillary? What happens to the concentration of albumin as blood travels through a capillary? At the very, very beginning, there's a higher capillary hydrostatic pressure. So what's being pushed out into the interstitium? Water. What's remaining? Albumin. So as we go through the tube, at the end of the tube, now the concentration of albumin has effectively done what? Gone up. So now what would those greater solutes do? <laughs> Suck the water back in. So what you see is that at the beginning of a capillary, there's greater filtration. At the other end, there's more reabsorption. This is that exchange, right? It's not just a matter of oxygen and CO2 exchanging in capillaries. It's also fluid. And you'll hear me say this a lot next week. The plasma of your blood is essentially the same as the interstitial fluid between your cells, which is essentially the same as the lymphatic fluid traveling through your lymphatic structures. And that exchange, where, how do these things talk to each other? How is it they're all the same? Is because of this exchange that happens at the capillaries. At about 2 thirds of the way through the capillary, there's no movement. In other words, uh, net filtration comes to zero, and that's because capillary hydrostatic pressure and the BCLP come to be equal to each other. And if there's no pressure difference, what happens? We just sit in a tube. If there's no pressure pushing water, what happens to the water? It doesn't move. If there's no net filtration pressure, then nothing is going to be continuing to be moving. You kind of come to a standstill. Everything's kind of stopped. Nothing's going into or out of the vessels. That's around two-thirds of the way through. But I've already said what happens. As you get to the far end of the capillary, off to the venous side, now reabsorption predominates. Now the CHP is less than the blood colloid osmotic pressure. Again, think about albumin. At the arterial side, water is being pushed out. And so at the venous side, the concentration of albumin is actually greater. That pulls more water in. That's the reabsorption that's going on. More water leaves your bloodstream than is reabsorbed. And this is your interstitial fluid. This is about three and a half liters a day. Three and a half liters a day you're losing from your bloodstream into your interstitium. Now it's being replaced, but you're losing three and a half liters. How much blood do you have? Well, you got about five or six liters of blood, and how much of your blood is water? How much of your blood is water? 92% of your plasma is water. Your blood, let's say a male, right? 50%, right? 50% formed elements, 50% plasma. So that means that the average male with a hematocrit of 50 has about two and a half liters of fluid, right? Maybe three. So what am I telling you? Essentially, your entire plasma volume every day is lost out of your blood and is exchanging at the capillaries with your lymphatic and interstitial fluids. Now it's replaced, but there's a lot of exchange here. So when you think about capillaries, don't just think about gas. 
Don't just think about nutrients. Don't just think about hormones. Also imagine this fluid that's moving back and forth. This is a great visual. So here we are, arterial side, greater pressure coming into the capillary bed. Here the capillary bed is shown as a single tube, but imagine you've got as many as 100 even of these little branches off the capillary bed. And as you enter into the capillary bed, the pressure is higher from the pressure of the blood than it is from the uh, colloid pressure. So that means that more stuff is being filtered out. But then at about two thirds of the way through, net filtration equals zero. And then as you get to the far venous side of the capillary bed, now reabsorption occurs. So you return most of it. But do you return all of it? No, I just told you that during a day you lose three and a half, three and a half, three point six liters of fluid that you don't return. So you're losing more than you return. Now, where do you think there could be some major variations here? Think about your lungs for a second. Do you have capillaries in your lungs? Right? Alveoli, gas exchange. Do you want to leave fluid behind in your lungs? No. So guess what? The story there is different. In the capillaries of your alveoli, you don't leave fluid behind. Okay? You do leave fluid around in most of your tissues. But in your alveoli, you don't want to leave fluid behind. So it's a little bit of a different story in your lungs. Okay. Now, what if you are hemorrhaging? Blood volume and blood pressure are decreasing. If your blood pressure decreases, that means your CHP, your capillary hydrostatic pressure, is going to decrease. And then what do you think is going to happen? It increases capillary reabsorption. Okay. So you're going to get more fluids. It kind of makes sense. Your body's trying to get fluid back, isn't it? So if your blood pressure is dropping, your blood volume is dropping, what's your body going to do? Try to gain some of that back. So it's going to try to gather some of that fluid back. So you'll see a greater, quote, recall of fluids coming back in at the capillaries. If you're dehydrated, what happens? Plasma volume would go down, blood pressure would go down, CHP would go down. Okay. And what if your CHP rises or the BCLP drops significantly? Does it make sense that you would have an increased filtration? And increased filtration means more fluid is going out into your body, and you would complain that you have edema, right? You're building up fluid. So what's the number one thing that's going to cause this? Again, most of your fluid levels, I want you thinking, are highly regulated by albumin. Right? So the albumin in your blood is really the major player here in regulating this BCLP. So how is the body regulating all this? We've talked about vessels, length, and viscosity, and diameter. We've, we've mentioned um, flow and resistance. We, we know a little bit about the arteries and veins. We know the heart's having to work to pump the blood, and the veins are having to kind of pull the blood back into the heart. So we talked about these big ideas. How is it regulating this whole thing? There is a couple different homeostatic mechanisms. You need to make sure that your tissues are well perfused. What was that word again? It meant that your tissues are getting enough oxygen and nutrients. And your tissues, like your brain, requires about 25% of all of your oxygen. It has to be highly perfused. Other tissues aren't quite as finicky, don't require as constant a high level. There are two main ways that your body's going to maintain this blood pressure. Number one is autoregulation. As the name suggests, it's going to happen at a local, um, a local place. And then there's central regulation. So this is where your central systems are going to call in, come into place. This is when your endocrine system kicks in. This is when your nervous system kicks in. And these will be activated if that autoregulation can't work. So autoregulation is your first place. The central is your backup. Now, in autoregulation, Basically, this involves changing blood flow within capillary beds. 
And do you recall, I mentioned this in 105, um, the flow of blood into capillaries is regulated in part. We know it just kind of goes in and it's kind of dripping in to a capillary bed. But I, I've also shown you pictures where at the beginning of the capillary bed there are little sphincters, little smooth muscle groups that act like little sphincters. And those little sphincters are going to close down and open and regulate the amount of blood coming into a capillary. The body kind of does that control. That's auto-regulation. That's not hormonal. That's not the nervous system. There is a certain amount of vasoconstriction, a, a certain amount of um, um, uh, a relaxation and contraction that occurs there that keeps the blood flow nice and smooth. If there was a vasodilator, what would it do? Open up those vessels and increase that flow. Now, central regulation, so that's what normally happens. Your body deals with this pretty well. But if that little bit of sphincter control is not enough, then the body kicks into central regulation. This is going to include both neural and hormonal signals. You're going to activate the cardioaccelatory center. This is going to activate vasomotor, and that is it's going to increase your peripheral vasoconstriction. If you increase your, vasoconstr your, your peripheral vasoconstriction, what's going to happen? You're constricting your vessels. Pressure is going to go up, right? Pressure is going to go up. And this can also increase your cardiac output because you have more blood going in. And it will reduce blood flow to non-essential tissues. So there's some control here. So when I say cardioaccelatory center and I tell you that some tissues aren't getting as much, what does that sound like? Sympathetic, parasympathetic, right? During a, a surge, you would have some tissues getting more blood than others. And the endocrine system is also going to be releasing vasoconstrictors and, and uh, norepinephrine, NE, is a powerful vasoconstrictor. So that's also going to increase your blood pressure. Nice little table here pulls it all together for you. It, it shows you on the bottom the auto-regulation, right? And that's all about those little sphincters. But also, um, it goes up. If that's not enough, if auto-regulation is insufficient, then it will kick into endocrine and neural mechanisms. Now, you were introduced to these before. Um, there are, <clears throat> as a part of this story, Bait, a baro and chemo receptors. What would a baro receptor do? Detect or monitor pressure. Okay. And these baro receptors are strategically placed in the carotid sinuses. The carotid sinuses are where the common carotid splits into the internal and external carotid. There's kind of a little space there, a sinus. And then also in the aortic sinus, that's the big space of the aortic arch, and in the right atrium. So there are cells here that are acting as baroreceptors. Now, what would baroreceptors? They're yin-yang, okay? They're not just on or off. So if the pressure increases, then the baroreceptors would be stimulated. And those baroreceptors are going to do what? Work to do what? If your pressure is going up, those baroreceptors are going to do everything they can to increase, or sorry, decrease your blood pressure and your heart rate. So what would you release? Would you increase, would you increase sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic, parasympathetic right? You want, to re, you want to reduce the blood pressure. Do you recall what is the neurotransmitter? of the parasympathetic system. When you think of sympathetic, you think norepinephrine or epinephrine, right? When you think of parasympathetic, acetylcholine. So guess what acetylcholine does to the heart? Slows it down. Okay, so acetylcholine is a uh, reducer in heart. Now, what does acetylcholine do for skeletal muscle? That is the major neurotransmitter that tells the muscle to contract. So we see acetylcholine does something different in skeletal muscle than it does here. Here it's going to help actually lower pressure. If instead, down here, 
the baroreceptors were decreased, pressure was low, what would your body want to do? Increase the pressure, right? We need to keep blood pressure within a homeostatic norm. And so here, we're going to do what? We're going to increase the heart rate. That might be through sympathetic uh, epinephrine. That could be through vasoconstrictors. Okay. So those are baroreceptors. And those baroreceptors, this is a nice little thing. It kind of goes through this. So the baroreceptors are stimulated. And that's going to cause a decrease in cardiac output. Or if the vaso, sorry, if the baroreceptors are inhibited, that's going to increase your cardiac output. So we're seeing all these different backup mechanisms, right? We've got we've got AMP, we've got renin, we've got we've got constriction dilation of the vessels. There are so many different things that are connected to your blood pressure. It must be pretty important. Right? All these different checks and balances going on. So we've got these baroreceptors. Um, there's, that's a, that's a uh, nervous system connection. Here's an endocrine system. We've already seen these before. Uh, we've got some hormones that are going to act short-term and some that are going to act long-term in helping to regulate the cardiovascular system. Number one, the heart. Tell me what hormone is being in, re released here. ANH or ANP, right? At, uh, atrionitriuretic peptide or atrionitriuretic hormone. That's released when pressure is too high. The kidneys, renin, when pressure is too low. Remember, that's the kidneys are responding, responding to low pressure. And then the pituitary gland, specifically hypothalamus releasing it through the posterior pituitary, releases ADH. And what does ADH do? Antidiuresis, fluid would be increasing, therefore pressure would increase. Okay, so we see these hormones. We know these hormones. This is just a nice little comfortable review about those blood pressures, or about those uh, hormones. Now, if we want to quickly respond to low blood pressure, the body can spit out some epinephrine. What would that do? Raise your heart rate, right? That's a quick response. We know that sympathetic changes are fast, right? Very rapid. So if there's a really dramatic, immediate response needed to a low blood pressure, the adrenal medulla can simply release some epinephrine or epinephrine. But again, if we want long-term regulation, ADH, we just talked about angiotensin II. Where was that one? Remember this angiotensin II? Renin, the angiotensin. Again, it's all about increasing pressure. How about EPO? It's... Yeah, it's made by the kidney, a little bit by the liver. And what does it do? It increases red blood, cells. red blood cells. If you increase red blood cells, you're going to do what? Increase viscosity and increase pressure. Okay, so that could have a small effect. And then aldosterone, we've seen before, also can have a long-term effect on fluid levels. And that's all beautifully shown here. So if you need to go back and read through this, uh, this re reviews for you, but I think you know, renin and EPO and puts in the same chart, angiotensin II, and also mentions epinephrine and norepinephrine. So take a look at that. That's a really nice overall view. This is figure 1922, but I think you'll find it to be very comfortable, but something that will be helpful to review um, as we start putting all these different features together. Angiotensin II is part of that renin pathway. So renin um, activated angiotensin one. Angiotensin was then uh, angiotensinogen, which went to angiotensin one. ACE then did angiotensin two. But collectively, what does it do? Increase blood pressure, right? So just know ultimately it's increasing blood pressure. And then here's ANP. Now, not only do you have ANP, where's ANP made? in the aorta, right, the atria. Not, did I say aorta? Atria. Atria. Um, there's also BNP. That would be the same stuff, but instead made by... Actually, this is made by the ventricles. Okay? So it's interesting. You've got, you've got ANP, 
released by the atria, and you have BNP released from the ventricles. Hmm. And what do they, they both do the same thing. They're going to do what? De they're, they're basically being released when pressure is too high. So what are they going to do? They're going to help to decrease the stress on the wall, which means that they're decreasing what? Volume of blood, which would decrease the stretch on the muscle, which we would also call preload. Remember, preload was the amount of stretch on the muscle, and that's what AMP is doing, isn't it? It's decreasing that. So again, you've got these peptides made by the heart, ANP and BMP. And we've talked about this before. What do they do? They are going to reduce blood pressure. How? Not just in one way. They're going to increase your urination, but they're also going to reduce your thirst. They're going to inhibit ADH. They're going to vasodilate your peripheral vessels. All of those collectively are going to have a significant decrease in your blood pressure. Okay, so we've got baroreceptors, and there are also chemoreceptors, another backup mechanism. Chemoreceptors are located in essentially the same place, the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. So in the carotid arteries and the aorta, that would, those would be good places, right, to measure blood pressure, baroreceptors, and chemoreceptors. These are not responding to pressure changes, but to chemical changes, specifically to pH. That's really the bottom line here. These chemoreceptors are responding to pH. Do you remember this story? CO2 plus water makes acid, carbonic acid, and carbonic acid is an acid, so what would it do to, what would it do to pH? Lower the pH, okay? So you know that with increased CO2, with increased CO2, right, as CO2 goes up, pH goes down. So that's really what these chemoreceptors are measuring. And they're measuring the pH of your blood. What's normal blood pH? 7, 4. If your blood pH was dropping down to 7, 3, what's happening? If the blood is becoming more acidic. What's causing it to be more acidic? Your blood is building up CO2. Okay. So what would your body do? It wants to get rid of that CO2. So what would your body do? Increase respiration. We'll get to that story with the respiratory system. Absolutely. You're going to want to get rid of that CO2, and you want to get more oxygen in. So your respiration rate is going to go up, and your heart rate would also go up. Okay. So if your blood pH starts to go down, we say you're becoming acidotic, you're becoming more, more acid, you know, going more toward acidosis. And why? For some reason, CO2 is accumulating. So you have these receptors measuring pH of your blood. And if those chemoreceptors are triggered, then they're going to cause a change in your blood pressure as well. So that's shown here in this figure. Again, if the chemoreceptors are stimulated, that is increased CO2. So increased CO2 stimulate the chemoreceptors, and that is now going to cause not only your respiration to increase, but also your heart rate to increase. Turn it around. If your blood pH is starting to go up 7.45, right, it's going up, what does that mean? Less CO2, more oxygen. What would that tell you? Hey, dude, you've got plenty of oxygen and you're not having a problem with your CO2, so what would it send a signal for your body to do? Decrease your respiration. So decrease your breathing rate and even slow down your heart. So we see this yin-yang going on with these chemoreceptors. Yep, yep, and we'll get to that in next chapter. Absolutely. Okay, she's talking about hyperventilation. We'll get to that next week. So what happens when you're exercising? At rest, here's a number, 5,800 mils per minute, I said last time, average around 6,000. Where did that 6,000 come from? A heart rate on average of 75. If your heart rate is 75 beats per minute, 
What's your R to R interval? Sixty divided by what equals seventy five? Point eight. So average R to R, average cardiac cycle, point eight seconds. That point eight second average, Jesse, gives you a heart rate of seventy five beats per minute. And then where did that six thousand come from? I gave you last time. Seventy five beats per minute times a stroke volume on average of eighty. Okay? Got it? During light exercise, what happens? Respiration goes up. Heart rate goes up. Venous return goes up. With increased venous return, that's going to increase your EDV, which is going to increase your stroke volume. The heart will also, because Frank Starling told us so, not only will it take in more blood, but it will also contract more forcefully. So together, this is going to give us an increase in cardiac output, mostly due to venous return. This is light exercise. Okay, we're going to get going to heavy duty here in a second. But as you get going, more blood comes over from your venous side and pops into your heart. Then during heavier exercise, you can get cardiac output up into the 17, 15 thousands. That is much, much higher. And now you've got increased flow of blood to your muscles, increased flow, of, uh, increased flow to your skin. Why do you want more flow to your skin? You become red, you become, you know, all rooty in complexion. It's going to help you get rid of heat. Those vessels in the skin or in the dermis are going to vasodilate. And there's going to be reduced flow to your gut organs. It sounds a lot like sympathetic, doesn't it? So when you're exercising, it's much the same distribution as if the bear was chasing you. And your blood flow to your brain stays pretty much unchanged. It has to. So even in sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, your nervous system has to maintain its function. So blood flow to the brain does not change significantly. It's that difference between the, the muscles and the gut organs that really makes the big change. So we just see here, right, at rest, brain, 750. Oops. At rest... The brain, pretty much the same, all the way across. Light, heavy exercise at rest, 750 mils per minute. Don't memorize the number. Idea, brain stays the same. What changes? Cardiac output's going up, right, as we go up into heavier exercise. What's going to get less and less? Do you agree the kidney's going to get less and less? Do you agree that the abdominal organs are going to get less and less? The skin, going to go up. Other tissues, Eh, kind of flat, right? Because we're not really talking, what, what's other? Who knows? Muscles are definitely going to go up, aren't they? Huge increase in muscles. But in the end, right, the brain stays the same. I think that's always interesting. The brain stays the same, even through all those huge differences in the cardiac output. The real yin-yang here is your abdominal kidney uh, versus your skeletal muscles. is the little arrow under, oh, no, what this is saying is that even the heart muscle itself, even the heart gets more oxygen and blood during exercise. So thank you. That little arrow that she's pointing to is this little one. At rest, your heart itself is getting about 250 milliliters per minute. That's through your coronary arteries. And as you exercise, that number does go up. So even the heart muscle is getting more blood. And while you are exercising, there are advantages or there are adjustments happening. And trained athletes will have bigger hearts, bigger stroke volumes. That's why you'll hear athletes have what? A lower resting heart rate. Because their heart is stronger. Their heart is more efficient. Therefore, their stroke volume is higher. And their heart rate does not have to be at, as high to accommodate. So most athletes have a resting heart rate lower than couch potatoes. Does that affect blood pressure too? It would affect blood pressure. So blood pressure is usually lower as well. I know. I have really low blood Yep. Pressure. Athletes have lower blood pressure. Um, why? 
their system is a little bit more healthy. They don't need as much pressure. Their resistance is lower. They don't have the peripheral resistance issues. So yeah, it's, it's overall better to have a lower pressure, not horribly low, but lower pressure, lower heart rate, all that's great. So the last thing is what happens when homeostasis fails? In other words, what happens when your blood pressure drops? When would your blood pressure drop? Let's think uh, you're going from bed to standing. What happens in older individuals sometimes when they go from laying down to standing up? They faint, they go, they, they have, they go dizzy. What happens? The body does not respond and the blood pressure does not immediately change such that the brain does not get the oxygen that it needs. Now in a younger person, all of these compensatory mechanisms are working. So when you go from laying down to rising up, those immediate changes in your blood pressure are made, those adjustments are made, and your brain will get the, the oxygen that it needs. But in an older person, as we start losing this homeostatic mechanism, you'll start having issues with maintaining your blood pressure and maintaining perfusion to the brain when standing quickly. Okay. So that can be a huge issue um, for some individuals. Now, where would the pressure be dropping? If you stand up, do you agree your baroreceptors would have lower pressure. And your baroreceptors, if your pressure is dropping to your brain, going up your carotid artery and out your aorta, what does your body normally do? If the baroreceptors, it quickly increases your pressure. But again, in older folks, or if there's any kind of mechanism, any kind of problem with uh, homeostasis, then they just can't make that quick adjustment. So what must we do for these people? Get up more slowly and be more intentional about up and going so that you don't have this rapid change. So, you know, a little older, a little slower. It's not just that their muscles are slower getting up. It's that literally they have to be a little slower so that their blood pressure has an opportunity to change so they don't have a fainting spell. So that's your carotid arteries, your baroreceptors, all that's happening so amazingly fast. And then long term, um, you've got hormones like aldosterone and ADH and renin and EPO that we've talked about that are also going to be helping to maintain your blood pressure long term. So if you have a dramatic decrease in your blood pressure, okay, again, we're going to have endocrine and nervous system signals coming in. On a very short term, um, we can have the baroreceptors kicking in. Long term, we have ADH and angiotensin II, aldosterone, EPO. Those hormones can come in and, and help bring the blood pressure back to normal. What is shock? Finishing up here, what is shock? There's, a different, there's different kinds of shock, but all shock is characterized as a dramatic drop in blood pressure. Okay, there's different forms of shock, different things that cause it, but shock is a, dra a rapid drop in blood pressure. We would say you go hypo hypotensive, right? It's an adequate blood flow to the tissues. Now, the most common would be circulatory shock. This is where um, heart damage, hemorrhaging, something's bleeding out, or you, you're dropping in blood pressure very quickly, you're bleeding out, the heart stops, something like that is going to be circulatory shock. But there's also progressive shock, and that is at some point, um, as you have this immediate setup, it progresses worse and worse. The blood pressure keeps getting lower, the venous blood coming back gets lower, cardiac output becomes inadequate. At this point, low cardiac output can start damaging the heart, and that even makes it worse, doesn't it? So if you damage the heart, then you've got even less contractility and less blood flow. And eventually, you will begin to reduce output to all of your tissues, and of course, the big one is your brain. Okay, so if you're not getting adequate there. Now, what if your blood is also not pumping very fast, then that could increase clotting too, couldn't it? So there can be issues with clotting. Um, that's going to further reduce flow and pH. Uh, we'll talk about this when we get the respiratory system. But what do you think would happen at a local level when pH starts to drop in your blood? Not up at the chemoreceptors, but like down at the capillaries. What do you think would happen? What would a lower pH tell your body to do? 
Low pH means that your body has, the, in that limited area, there's too much CO2. That means there's not enough oxygen. What do you think your body would do at a localized microscopic level if there was a decrease in pH? Vasoconstrict or vasodilate? If there is a lack of oxygen, what would your tissues want to do? Increase blood flow or decrease blood flow? Increase, right? So pH is oftentimes has an effect. If the, if the localized pH is dropping, then it will cause the tissues to vasodilate, okay? It'll cause an increase in blood flow, and that will uh, help out. So there can be um, an increase in blood volume but also a decrease in blood volume based upon pH. And then at some point, this shock um, will start triggering, you know, the baroreceptors will trigger, and that will cause a huge sympathetic surge, right? If your baroreceptors are not, if your baroreceptors are being uh, activated, you're not getting the blood up to your brain, that's going to cause a sympathetic flow. And what's that going to cause? What happens with sympathetic surges, vasoconstriction, right? And that's going to increase your blood flow to your brain for a short while, but it's going to reduce blood flow to the rest of your body, isn't it? Your brain's going to be making up, taking up extra blood. And at some point, the body just can't keep making these adjustments. And so at this point, uh, you can go into an irreversible situation where you go into circulatory collapse. The body can no longer do this. Um, and this is going to lead to widespread vasodilation. Um, so circulatory collapse is widespread vasodilation. What's going to happen in this situation? This happens in um, some, anybody had micro yet? A few people had micro. There are some bacterial infections. And when that toxin from the bacterium gets into the bloodstream, the toxin itself is a very powerful vasodilator. So what happens if all of a sudden all of your vessels in your body opened up? Blood pressure is going to go, boom, drop. That'd be another kind of shock, right? Blood pressure drops immediately. Well, what's happening now? That means you're not getting adequate flow to your brain, adequate flow to your tissues. And so there's all sorts of different ways that shock can happen. But what you're seeing is that there's a dramatic drop in blood pressure and you're starting to see the body's going to try, right? It's going to do everything it can to bring that blood pressure back up. And if it's not restored soon, then death is going to follow, right? We're not going to be able to, to get through this. You always hear, like, after someone is in an accident, oh, they're in shock. That's a little different. It can be the same, but typically we're talking about something different. So be careful of those two words. Oh, they're in shock. What does that kind of mean to us? In everyday terms, shock means they're just kind of... It does. It does cope with it that way, too. But we think of when we hear someone's in shock outside of a medical field, we think they're just sort of dazed, if you will. They're, they're overwhelmed by their situation. They're not thinking clearly. Yes, there is some of that physiological shock going on as well. But kind of keep those two words a little bit different. So at some point, then, the, the whole blood flow stops, right? You, you've done everything you can, and basically... Um, Life cannot go on if you're not able to restore that very, very quickly. So you see there's a drop in blood pressure, a drop in blood volume. That decreases cardiac output. That itself can decrease flow and damage the heart, which even makes it worse. That's a, what kind of feedback loop is that? When it starts to get bad, it gets even worse? That's a positive feedback, isn't it? So in a low-pressure situation, as cardiac output drops and the heart is actually getting damaged, it's getting worse and worse and worse. That would be an example of a positive feedback loop. And then the body just keeps trying everything it can to increase blood flow. And at some point, you've constricted everything you possibly can. You've got now irreversible cardiac muscle damage. And at some point, on the bottom, right, death, circulatory collapse and death. So that brings us to the end of cardiovascular. I, I've got 20 minutes, and so I want to spend a few minutes just kind of reviewing anything and everything that you're concerned about. Is there anything, let's start with that blood chart. Let's go back to blood. 
Is there anything on that blood handout? If you don't have one, I did post them and I have some extras hanging outside my office upstairs. And again, you will see that exact image on the exam and there are 30 questions coming from this. So you need to be able to name all those cells, tell me their ranges, tell me what they're uniquely treat, you know, what they're uniquely designed to do, the eosinophils, parasites, neutrophils, bacteria. Um, you need to be able to tell me their relative size and their numbers. So is there anything on that chart that you're wondering about? Um, for the lifespan and days. Lifespan and days. The red blood cells. Red cells. 120. Platelets, 8 to 10. White blood cells vary from hours to days, even to years. And we didn't get into the lymphatic system yet, but you hear about having memory. Why do you, why do you get immunized? Right, so that your body has memory against something foreign 20 years down the road. So some of your lymphocytes that are making antibodies hang around for your entire lifespan. However, other white blood cells are produced at the time of a crisis and then are quickly destroyed. So your span of white blood cells is not a number that you need to memorize. But you do need to appreciate the lifespan of a red blood cell, 120 days, and the lifespan of a platelet, 8 to 10 days. Okay, and then the number of cells in... Number of cells in a microliter of blood. If we go back to... In a microliter of blood, how many red blood cells should there be roughly? Four to six million-ish, right? How many should there be platelets in that same one microliter of blood? 130,000 up to about 400,000. And how many white blood cells should there be? 5,000 to 10,000. And then you know that eosinophils should be between 2 and 4% of those five to 10,000. Basophil should be less than 1% of that 5 to 10,000. Neutrophil should be up to 70% of that 5 to 10,000. Yes? yes? Everyone see where we're going with this? Monocytes between 3 and 8. Lymphocytes between 25 and 33% of that 5 to 10,000. It'll be matching. It'll be a word bank. It won't be raw numbers, you'll be matching up numbers that make sense and putting them into a chart. Where's your office? 1118. 1118. And I posted it on Blackboard under Lecture 3 exam, but I do have a small stack of them sitting right outside 1118. 1118, when you get up there, look down the hallway and you'll see the new building. They've got the hallway cleared now. You can see right down the hallway into what will be the new building. So if you stop by there, take a quick look. It's looking really nice. Anything else on blood, that blood chapter? Again, 30 questions. That's a, that's a good chunk. So make sure you spend a few minutes looking at that. Anything else about blood? Make sure you know the features of white cells and red cells and platelets. Anything about muscle, skeletal muscle? Somebody talk to me about the excitation contraction coupling. Should we go through this in our head really quick? What are the steps? What are the steps? What has to happen first? Action potential. Where is that action potential coming from? We're moving a skeletal muscle. Coming from the motor strip. It's going to come down the spinal cord. And that's going to be the upper motor neuron, isn't it? And the upper motor neuron is then going to synapse with a lower motor neuron in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And then that neuron, that lower motor neuron, is going to go all the way out to the muscle. At the axon terminals, at the synaptic knob, what's going to happen? What's that look like? Action potential comes down. Voltage-gated calcium channels open. Those voltage-gated calcium channels bind to synaptic vesicles containing acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is our neuro, neurotransmitter, or our, sorry, our neurotransmitter of choice here. And then what happens? Those vesicles exocytose, the product acetylcholine floats across the 
postsynaptic cleft and is picked up on the postsynaptic cell. Here, that postsynaptic cell is a muscle cell, right? We're on the muscle. And we call this area of the muscle cell what? Motor end plate. And what happens there? The acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor. This is also referred to as a ligand or ligand gated channel. And when those acetylcholines bind, what opens? Sodium gates. Those sodium gates now allow sodium in. And we know what happens. That influx of sodium causes a potential change in the muscle cell. That potential spreads away from the motor end plate and travels down the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the, mem the membrane of the muscle cell. And along the muscle cell, we find a bunch of rabbit holes. Those rabbit holes are called T-tubules. And that signal is going to go down the T-tubule. And down in the T-tubule, that electrical activity is going to do what? Come in contact with sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that voltage change is going to cause a voltage release of calcium. That calcium is now released where? Into the T-tubule or into the sarcoplasm? Into the sarcoplasm. And what is densely packed in the sarcoplasm? Myofibrils. And what are myofibrils? Long chains of sarcomeres, which mean they're long chains of actins and myosins. So what does that calcium do? As long as there's an action potential coming down, and as long as there's acetylcholine opening up the sodium channel, and as long as that is continuing, that calcium is going to be binding to troponin. Troponin is one of the little proteins that's part of the thin filament. Remember the thin filament? It's not just actin. It's also tropomyosin, that rope around the actin, as well as some little snowman-looking molecules. Those are the troponins. So the calcium binds to that troponin. And as a result of it binding to troponin, what happens? It causes a conformational shift, and tropomyosin then shifts out of the way. When tropomyosin shifts, what is it exposing? The actin, the actin binding site for myosin. So now, myosin and actin can hang out together. Now, where does the next story go? That is the ex that's the excitation, right? The ex that's the excitation part. The excitable signal has come down and caused something to happen in the muscle. But now we have a contraction. What's going on with the contraction? Where does ATP fit into the story? ATP binds, but ATP is necessary for the actins and myosins to dissociate, to release. And then it cocks, and then it binds, right? And then it, so you've got that story down. And then what happens when the action potential is no longer being sent? When you stop telling your muscle to contract, kind of erase everything. So what has to happen? At the muscle, what must happen? The calcium must come off the troponin. When the calcium comes off the troponin, tropomyosin flips back and no longer allows actin and myosin to bind. So you've stopped the whole sliding filament thing going on. That calcium is then quickly sequestered back. It's quickly sucked back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that means what? That what else is going on at the synaptic cleft? Acetylcholine esterase is also helping to minimize this by breaking down acetylcholine. So you've got a lot of things going on so that this happens so fast, so that you can move your finger up and down very quickly. You have to think, okay, relax, you know, contract, relax, relax, contract. It's amazing. I can't even say it fast enough how fast this whole thing happens. But you should be able to kind of walk through that story in your head. And if you're having trouble with that, there are definitely some videos. If you go into the study area of mastering and go to AP Flicks, I know you watch those movies either in class with me and or as part of your homework assignments, but if you need to hear the woman say it one more time and go through this thing, watch a couple videos, go to the AP Flicks, it's under lab, and there are those nicely done videos that go through this step by step. You need, again, to be able to kind of picture that contraction cycling as well as picture the whole EKG, pumping of the heart, blood, ventricular D and repolarization story. 
And if you've got that as a little video playing in your head, you'll be able to answer a lot of questions. A lot, a lot of questions. Anything else about the muscle? Anything else about muscle? I went through, you know, summation, tetanus, all those things. Anything else in that conversation? What energy source do muscles use immediately? Skeletal muscle. For just a couple seconds, they have enough ATP, right? But the ATP is very quickly burned up because the body does not store ATP. We do not store ATP anywhere. We make it constantly as needed. To make extra would be a waste. And once that ATP is gone, then what do we use as a muscle source for energy? Yep, CP. We go to creatine phosphate, and then that allowed that that gives the body time to kind of get caught up, and then by that point your respiration rate's increased and your oxygen flow is increasing to your muscles, and then you can keep going for a while, but at some point, depending upon your level of training, what's gonna happen? There won't be enough local oxygen and the pH will start to drop because what builds up? With, not, with no oxygen, the mitochondria can't make ATP at sufficient levels. And in anaerobic, what is made? Lactic acid. And that lactic acid now causes a decrease in the pH. And what does that decrease in pH do? Yes, that's the muscle burn. That's your fatigue. But it actually, that low pH actually starts to interfere with the ability of actins and myosins to contract. It also um, um, slows down the entire signal, right? So the muscles get slower and more fatigued and no longer can contract as forcefully because of that low pH. So that that... That low pH, that lactic acid burn, is not only a sign that your bodies are in an anaerobic state, but also that fatigue is coming. Anything else in that story of the skeletal muscle? Are we having fun? This has to be fun, right? I know school's not easy. But it has to be at least a little bit of fun, or else it's horrendous. And some of you are like, "Yeah, this is horrendous." Um, but really, you got to you got to make fun of you know you got to be in, you have to enjoy the learning process, or else this is horrible. Yeah. Everything's crunchy. Yep. Falling apart, <laughs> falling apart. Yeah. You can. It's not going to help you much, is it? Right? Yeah. Um, did you see, I saw a, a, a video recently of a nurse, and I want to say she was 92. She'd been working in the hospital for 70 years, and she was still actively working. 92 years old, and she looked to be 55. She looked like she was just running around. She'd probably slap everyone around. A um, little spry woman, but 70 years as a nurse. I just couldn't, that was a recent little Facebook, YouTube thing that I saw. I don't know where that came from. I guess because you're talking about how old you are. In light of her, you're not old. So that's where I was going with that. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? We got, we got five minutes just as the clock runs. Anything else just to review or say again or clarify? Question. Yes. The, the um, like little review questions in here, is that something that like, we should be really... Well, I mean, if I were, if I were to give you a review sheet, I would simply gather up all those little questions and put them on a sheet and say, here, here's your review sheet. So yeah, they are little stop and think questions. I'm not going to say that I, I did not go through and specifically find a question for every one of those, uh, but those, those are there to help you. Okay, do I understand what I just read the last 10 slides? Is it making sense? Stop and think. If you go in the back of your book, all the answers to those questions are in the book. Yes. Yes. Yep. Those answers are on the back of the book. All those review questions. What's left on mastering for this test? Just the quiz on heart due tomorrow night at midnight. Um, there is also an adaptive follow-up for the heart chapter. If you didn't make the 90% on the homework, that is due by tonight. The quiz is due by tomorrow night. And then what did I tell you? If you feel want, still want more practice, you could go ahead and take a look at that PAL quiz that is on mastering. 
It's on next Thursday on the calendar. You'll do it before your lab exam next Tuesday, but you may want to take a peek at it and take some practice. It'll only help you, and uh, you could always go back and review it after you took it in preparation of your lab exam next week. So if you want to just knock it out and get it over with, that's fine, and then review it in preparation of the lab exam. But it's another great tool to help you. And um, cardiac action potential. Ah, cardiac action potential is good. Mm -hmm. So when we think about an action potential, we know this like, you know, really well, right? Mm -hmm. Neuron, action potentials, skeletal muscle, pretty much the same story. What was different in cardiac? Plateau. The plateau. What caused the plateau? Just slow calcium. We didn't have calcium channels in skeletal muscle or neurons, did we? In Action potentials that we learned in the nervous system and what we learned in skeletal muscle, it was sodium in, potassium out, right? That was it. But in cardiac muscle, we see that calcium is also a major player and that it's the calcium, slow calcium channels that contribute to and maintain that long plateau. And that long plateau assures that the heart cannot do what? Cannot go to tetanus. It also means it cannot do summation, right? So it can't do summation, but it also can never reach tetanus. It's a good thing, right? Otherwise, your heart would go into, you know, stop. Question, Heidi. Um, if we did, for the case study, if we did the face thing one, there's a question where there's like a picture of like a... Flow chart? No, it's like a vertebrae, like a, an outline of the spinal cord. If there's something in a case study that you can turn that in with your hard copy, don't worry about uploading it for your, for your questions. Yeah, I was going to say Fair enough. So don't worry about uploading something that's a, either a flow chart or something you need to write out. That, if it's something that's graphical that can't be uploaded, just give me the hard copy of that and just upload everything else. So to just print off the case study. Print off just a couple pages or that, that particular page that you need to do. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Case studies, lab reports, exam. We've got a busy week, right? We've got exam Thursday, lab exam next week. Floating through this, you've got a case study and your lab report. So... Um, you're getting your money's worth, I hope. Anyone feeling gypped out? You ever taken that class where you're like, man, we did nothing. What did I pay for? In this class, do you feel gypped? Yeah, do you feel gypped? I, don't, I hope you don't feel gypped, right? It's like, it's like half a penny per fact. It's a good deal. It's a good deal. Okay, I will see you all, some of you tonight, all of you on Thursday, those in hybrid. I'll see you on Thursday in lab.